So, all right, up next we have Dr. Ned Budisa, Professor and Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Chemical Synthetic Biology at the University of Manitoba. Dr. Budisa earned his Bachelor's of Science in Molecular Biology and a Master's in Biophysics in 1993 from the University of Zagreb, Croatia. He received his PhD at the Max Planck Institute of Biochemistry in Germany in 1997 under Nobel laureate Robert Huber in his habilitation in 2005 from the Technical University of Munich in Germany. He worked afterwards as a junior group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Biochemistry in Munich. He was appointed as full professor at the Technical University of Berlin in 2010, where he stayed until 2018 after accepting his current position at the University of Manitoba. Dr. Budisa has been a prolific publisher and received many awards for his research, including the BioFuture Prize in 2014, the Publication Prize of the German Chemical Society in 2017, and the Mercator Fellowship of the German Research Foundation in 2022. His primary work is based on the use of synthetic amino acids to expand the genetic code with the goal of reinventing biological complexity and creating synth synthetic life forms and the technologies based on them. So we're very excited to have you here today, Dr. Pedisa, and uh, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very, very much for your uh, kind words and, and, and uh, invitation. Um, uh, I do hope you can see my slides. And um, I would like today also to make a general talk. And I consider myself really lucky that Jamie talked before me. Uh, and uh, I think uh, um, we can now focus a uh, little bit from a ribosome, go a little bit um, upstream to amino acid RNA synthesis, and then talk about the choices of amino acids for for protein translation and how we can influence these 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 choices. And this is actually what is expanded genetic call all about. So we had also last uh, couple of last uh, last few years we had uh, also lots of uh, lots of um, exciting development, especially in in the terms of application, but today I would really like to discuss with you because uh, uh, GC for all center should be the place where we should also discuss the issue of uh, expanded genetic code, because I would like to also to demonstrate to you that we still need uh, a lot to invest a lot of in uh, methodological development because um, we have uh, many interesting uh, biotechnological and biological questions to be answered with uh, with um, with the uh, ex expansion of the genetic group. So here is something that you already all know why we are very much interested in ribosomal protein translation because you know this process is templated. This process makes almost no mistake. Uh, and uh, only what we do not like this is that nature standardized protein translation on the 20, 20 or 20 plus two, some say uh, amino acids. And our, of course, the question is uh, how we can expand the scope of, of, of protein engineering or, and how we can expand the scope of protein translation. And to expand the scope of protein translation, what we need, we need a skillful combination of, uh, of our knowledge in synthetic chemistry, our knowledge of uh, cell physiology and genetics, and of course, our knowledge of the genetic code genetic code structure and genetic code evolution and all uh, old components or everything what structural biology provide us uh, uh, about the, about the translation of translational machinery so first of all uh, the what why we are motivated to do this work so if you have a chemical uh, background then you will see and you look at the side chains of amino acid you will see these are alpha mainly alpha amino acids with the proline is exception and glycine is also exceptional amino acid but the majority of them are actually having a side chains with the defined chemistries and you look at this and if you know organic chemistry then you will see that we are dealing with limited chemical diversity and of course it's the question and when we are talking about synthetic cell we simply think whether we can expand um, chemical implementation of life and i think engineering of the genetic code is one of the most promising route toward, toward, toward this direction. This is a kind of big picture of the whole, whole field, which is often neglected, but it should be always kept, kept in front of the eyes. So when I started uh, this and, and in, the, in the Munich and after my habilitation, often people ask me, okay, why you want 
to modify side chains of amino acids code translation because the nature uh, has a marvelous, has a beautiful uh, battery of enzymes and tools that you can make post translation and modification of almost every side chains. And there, are this, there is a whole inventory of this uh, natural post translation and modification. And now, you, uh, uh, why don't you simply try to uh, simply manipulate process of post translation and modification? And then by manipulating process of, of protein uh, of post translation and modification, you can also achieve uh, expanded or you can expand the chemical space for for for, for proteins. And it's actually is a legitimate question. And my answer to this is that post translation machineries are very 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 complex. And the post translation machinery often is a part of compartmentization. That's mean compartmentization is important principle in design of living cell and the life. Then the question is always of the scaling, because we need to have a proteins uh, produced in the large scale. And uh, for that, especially, we would also like to have a homogeneous product in large amounts. And then uh, for, uh, for that, processation machinery is often not suited. And then these recognition features, as soon as we move this processation machinery in our experimental setup, these subtle recognition features are easy, easy, easy to be destroyed. Then um, of course, uh, cross translation and modification is much easier for to make labeling for our academic purpose. And at the end of at the end of the day, if we can expand the scope of protein translation and be really uh, related with this also for uh, metabolic engineering and all other things, then we will of course have a good route toward toward synthetic life, which I will not talk today. I will as I said we'll talk about about uh, uh, about some issues in the in the field. So we we will all agree that a choice of amino acid or the choice of side chains of amino acids is done by enzymes. Ribosome actually decode uh, genetic information, but interpretation is on the level of amino acid RNA synthesis. And we can consider ourselves again, uh, I, I can say lucky because we, we today have a very, very good structural and biochemical information regarding amino acylation process, regarding the activation, regarding tRNA charging, we have a, uh, such such a plenty of uh, plenty uh, of knowledge that we can of course then go toward to, toward the engineering and then our engineering actually would be either we can manipulate with endogenous amino acid tRNA tRNA uh, tRNA synthetase tRNA pair uh, or simply to install new new amino acylation pathway and uh, genetic code expansion is about to install new amino acylation pathway. So um, when we are uh, talking about um, uh, uh, orthogonal translation, uh, we, we normally we think about that we would have uh, three frames of codon and that we try then simply to make read translational read route uh, as efficient as, as, as possible. Of course, the future direction of the field would be sense codon reassignment, but let us today talk about, about the stop stop codon suppression as, as, as a main main pathway. And there's something also what is often forget. It's not only issue that we have to have somehow efficient ribosomal translation with, uh, with a stop codon read through, but there are also a couple of other prerequisites which we are often neglect is first of all, whether amino acid is metabolically stable, whether, whether uptake works well. Uh, we need to have a, a quite solid or a sufficient intercellular accumulation, uh, the amino acid should avoid editing because we know this amino acid already synthesis and editing. We also, uh, we do not know, or there's a very limited studies that show how this amino acid uh, reacts with, uh, with, with the uh, translation factor, for example, uh, uh, elongation factor TU. Then um, story about accommodation, the ribosome, peptidyl transfer, co-translation and folding, overall folding, you, you, you hear now from Jay, that actually is also a problem of folding to select an ribosome, which give folded structure is also also issue. And I was very happy that then to, 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 to see here because we also uh, know that uh, uh, by working by simple amino acid analogs, that some amino acid analogs simply lead to the to 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 the nature the nature proteins. And of course, we have a general conditions. You should have design strength, cultivation conditions, metabolic configuration, and so on, and 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 so so on. So uh, and of course, when we are making our presentation, we are trying to impress audience 
simply saying, look what we can. We have a more than 200 amino acids. We can co-translationally uh, bring in the, the proteins. Nature has a 20 amino acids. That means we are really uh, uh, one order of magnitude better than the nature. The question is, are we really? Because many of these amino acids are, to a certain degree, are integrated in the proteins. But, and you can, of course, use for different academical purposes. You can make some 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 kind of uh, a nice nice research, uh, uh, nice academic research, and so. But very few of them actually have a significant technological, for example, biomedicine or for uh, or, or or to solve some some urgent uh, urgent uh, biotechnological problems. And I think when genetic code expansion as a field uh, provides some fundamental technology, which would be kind of game changer, as today is popular to say. Then our also field will not be any more marginal, but will be, will, will come to the scientific scientific mainstream. Therefore, you know, in the mart, if I can say so, today we have then the majority is metanocaldococcus yanashi based tyrosine DNA synthetase developed in Pete Schultz lab, who made a great work to 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 bring this field forward. And another field was a natural orthogonal pair. Uh, which uh, is discovered by Kaziki in Ohio State University 2004 um, uh, with the methanosarcina, uh, um, uh, this means also methanogens, pyrolysine uh, tRNA synthetase based pair. It's interesting, it's quite interesting also sociologically talking that the first humans invented orthogonal pairs and then we found them later also that nature used use orthogonal pair in this particular case is methano, methano, methanobacteria. So, in order to engineer, that means that it's clear that uh, interpretation of the genetic code is a business of amino acid RNA synthetases. And then if we want now to change uh, uh, genetic code, we, we should be able to change uh, substrate specificity of amino acid RNA synthetases. And we learn in biochemistry book in the school, these enzymes are, are, are quite precise. These, these enzymes are quite specific if there would be no if, if there are if there would be no specific would be no editing function and so there would be of course uh, a mess in interpretation of the genetic code but curiously these enzymes are indeed uh, ex exhibit like all other enzymes different level of substrate tolerance people also call about substrate promiscuity i just presented here one example of methionine tRNA DNA synthetase, what you can see, you can see this is a methionine with this tie eater side chain. And then you, you, you can't believe that you can make azidohomoalanine, homopropylglycine, even cyclopropylalanine. And, and these all amino acids are, yeah, you can incorporate by simple oxotrophy uh, by Tyrell uh, method developed by Dave Tyrell, oxotrophy method, which I was working for years and we are still working on it. And, and when you are, but when you are measuring the parameters, you see that the catalytic parameters are. Are substantially substantially um, uh, reduced, and actually, what this is what I'm missing in the field that we don't have actually enough uh, 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 catalytical characterization para parameterization of our enzymes. If we would have more, more parameterization, they would have said certainly our field will, would would uh, would um, forward much better forward. And of course, what we are doing, we are uh, we are always, um, and this is what uh, uh, what we are doing now. Is uh, just looking on the side chains around the substrate. Then we randomize these side chains and uh, this uh, 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 the, the number of side chains that one can randomize around the binding pocket is uh, quite limited. And then what we are we are again lucky living in the time that we have an immense computational progress uh, in the computational biology, and then we can generate generate focus focus library. I am not a specialist for this. But I, um, I I worked um, in in the Berlin with a team of the people. There was one postdoc uh, who was in the in the lab of David Becker, and then we just took uh, for methanocaldococcus yanashi tyrosine tRNA synthetase, and then we were focused simply say okay we will look for the residues in the first shell, uh, but we will also look in the residues in the residues of the of the of the of the second shell, and this is one thing. And second thing is we are using a focused library. The uh, focus library will enhance number of side chains that we can randomize the uh, number of side chains that we can test it for the for the for for, for, for the activity, and then um, uh, and in that in that way we would overcome traditional problem of traditional problem of uh, uh, that we um, that that we can randomize only few 
few few few residues. And uh, as a here example with our uh, minor acid, which we are which we are very much interested, this is a DOPA. We would we wanted to have a, a cage DOPA, the OMB. We call it OMB DOPA. And uh, in this OMB DOPA, to make now long story short, uh, one can make then a kind of focus focused library using just different stages of computational design. And this computational design will ask them uh, uh, will will make a couple of Russian solutions. And as you can see now, we are not any more, for example, position Y32 is not any, we don't need any more now to randomize uh, uh, night in amino acid, but uh, simply the Rosetta will tell us you have only two amino acids to, 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 to randomize. And then this position, we have only five amino acids. So that means when you focus uh, and each residue has only few number of residues that you are going to randomize, then of course, number of of residues that uh, that that can be mutated is much higher, and of course, then we expect that the activity of our enzyme will be actually better. So what we did, we did very simple superfolded GFP, superfolded GFP in uh, in um, uh, as a fusion protein from Sumo domain, and we can simply uh, have one in frame stop codon, or we can have um, uh, five in frame stop codons, and this is a just simple result in the Escherichia coli. PL21, which is our working force uh, for the protein expression. So what you see, this is in this enzyme, uh, if you express just methanol, carlococcus, yanashi, or MJ, uh, wild type enzyme. And then this is uh, our enzyme, which we actually performs with the uh, OMB tyrosine. In this particular case, we are talk I'm talking now on the, on, on the tyrosine because we also work on the on, on other tyrosine. Uh, and then what you see, you see that the performance of this enzyme is as good as as, um, as, as a wild type, but we just compared the um, originally published by Pete Schultz, and then we also compared also methanocardo, uh, methanosarcina uh, plasmid for Jason Chin, and that you see that actually this focused library in, uh, substantially increased increase, uh, uh, activity. So, and then on the other hand, um, this is quite interesting. So we move now in the in the strain of this uh, 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 the strain which has deleted amber codons, and then we don't 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 do not have such 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 efficiency. This is a quite interesting observation, but which one can one one can uh, later later discuss. So, but it's obviously that configuration of the cell influences uh, our, our outcome of orthogonal orthogonal optimization. Okay, so. Um, and then to make now long story short, I come back to 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 our OMB DOPA because OMB DOPA uh, uh, motivated us because I said that the field will go forward if we just solve one uh, substantial problem and the substantial problem would be, for example, to have underwater adhesion and this uh, underwater adhesion you can achieve with muscle uh, 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 muscle food proteins, which uh, are, is a kind of cocktail of proteins. Among the most important ones are those who are directly participating in uh, in um, uh, adhesion, and this adhesion is underwater adhesion. And we now know that moiety, which is most probably responsible for adhesion, is is the DOPA. And our idea, of course, is to have a technology that we can provide a DOPA, but this DOPA should be uh, should be um, inert, and then upon the radiation should 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 become would become active. And once if we would have and to have a scale production of, of such compound, we would we would we would we would make revolution in 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 dentistry, in biomedicine, in environment because this this would be uh, would be um, biomaterial of of enormous enormous importance. And uh, uh, we, of course, did the same as I showed before the OMB tyrosine. We also did the same with OMB DOPA. And then with the OMB DOPA, um, we could also make a focus libraries. And now, again, to make long story short, because we have a short time, uh, uh, look, this is our uh, food protein, wild type food protein with five in frame, with a 10 and 19 in frame stop columns, because we know that one food protein, natural food protein, has about nine, has a 19. 19 dopa dopa moieties. So what we did, we did a, also a, 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 we did an orthogonal translation expression in the Sherichia coli BL21 using or uh, these uh, variations which is made by Sakamoto, and then we just perform perform translation uh, uh, um, expression. I can tell you in advance. You see the protein yields actually drop down, and I would say drop down expand almost exponentially, or drop down than always one order of magnitude. Uh, 
uh, with the increased number of in-frame stop codons. You see the wild type protein gives about 18 milligram per milliliter, where we could not detect product with the 19, 19 um, with the with the, with 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 the 19 in-frame in-frame stop codon. Obviously, we, we have here a very efficient enzyme. The enzyme really works very well, as, as I demonstrated also, uh, as you demonstrated on, on Superfold, the GFP. But uh, as soon as we are increasing number in frames of codons, there are some other factors play, playing the role. And this is also one issue which I would like to present here. And this is in GC for all. We should also discuss this or should, should, should be aware of this. There are limitations and these limitations most probably uh, uh, will be um, uh, will be overcome by uh, by uh, including ribosomes and uh, engineering of ribosomes in in, in, in our, our our research. And uh, at the end, I would simply uh, like uh, to tell you 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 heard by Jamie talk before uh, thermostable ribosomes. We were also here in the field mainly working with a, with a thermostable. We are working with a, with a thermostable enzymes. You know this uh, methanocaldococcus yanashi tyrosine here and synthetase is. Is a stable, stable enzyme, and if you take a native enzyme, it just make CD uh, curve theta two two two, and you are just try to melting, and you will see it melts above above 100, 100 degrees. But this this uh, first one, this is a Schultz enzyme, and this is our enzyme. And what you see, you see by introducing this large number of mutations, actually we uh, we, we we have a, uh, we should pay some uh, um, entropy or entropy or, or uh, let, let's say generally price in the stability, and then that these proteins are less stable, but they still, you know, they are come now in the kind of mesophilic region, and they are still in our mesophilic bacteria, bacteria quite, quite, quite active. We have, of course, interesting development with my talented co-worker, Nikolai Koch, which we can also think about um, uh, use uh, psychophilic enzymes, but this is a maybe story for some, some other, other, other things. So let me now Briefly, in a few minutes that left, let me now briefly briefly summarize. Uh, uh, I can uh, we, we have now. Uh, I don't think that it's on the level of te technical level. It's problem to make enzyme for substrate specificity. Even with the Nikolai work recently, we could demonstrate that we can make amino acids even with the small small side chains, which is of course a big 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 issue in uh, big issue in, in orthogonal orthogonal translation. See, we can put series of um, of uh, methionine analogs. We can make SLE, um, SLE cysteine as one of the smallest amino acids, which we, which we can uh, make a, a translation in an interesting biorthogonal orthogonal orthogonal tag. And um, that means we should certainly, like in uh, enzyme engineering, ribosome engineering, engineering, of course, uh, complete uh, orthogonal. Uh, Complete central dogma starting from uh, from uh, from DNA to to the protein uh, to make uh, uh, xeno DNA, xeno RNA, xeno tRNA, xeno ribosome, xeno proteins. So to make really uh, really xeno orthogonal orthogonal life, and that it will be of course certainly expired expired by these uh, extremophiles. On the other hand, uh, as as I see, we should also think about maybe maybe uh, to have a too many in frames of codon maybe is not a good idea, and we should think about to go in the sense codon. Sense codon reassignment that would be uh, an, another possibility. And third possibility is, of course, the field of, and I'm not talking about this, is also subject of a separate talk is uh, nature evolved standard amino acid repertoire using metabolism. All these 20 amino acids are product of metabolism. Some of them you immediately recognize from central metabolism. Uh, and, and uh, also genetic code expansion in the field will be developed uh, when we also develop for interesting amino acid, highly valuable non-canonical amino acid should be also a synthetic pathway should be invented so that we feed bacteria with very, very old bacteria or microbial or, or, or eukaryotic cell with a quite cheap, simply precursors. And then uh, we simply couple this metabolic engineering with the Reprogramming protein translation, and then that would be then certainly certainly uh, bring the whole field to to the maturity. And that's all what I would like to share with you because I would also like to have a few minutes of time for for, for discussion. So I had a lucky in Berlin uh, to have uh, to work with the talented people. I also have here in Winnipeg in, uh, in, in Manitoba also talented uh, to work with the talented people to learn how not American 
system works and compare it with the German system to see what are the advantages and disadvantages. Uh, and I'm then just trying to make best of all two of possible world. Here I would like to simply uh, uh, emphasize two Tobias, Tobias Schneider and Tobias Baumann, who actually uh, made um, a crucial contribution to, uh, uh, to, to the chemical synthesis of uh, uh, radio, uh, radio chemical synthesis of um, of uh, OMB DOPA and uh, and the Tobias who developed complete uh, orthogonal translation and our, of course our our talent Nikolai who uh, uh, who bring this uh, uh, who bring complete um, uh, this, who kind of uh, uh, articulate all these ideas and then of course made great great work in the last last years and I would like to thank you for attention I'm looking forward for a couple of questions. Thank you, Dr. Pedusev. That was a really fantastic talk. So we have a few more minutes. We can open the floor for some questions. So I can I can offer one quick question. Um, your the ONBY RS1 synthetase has a really impressive improvement in incorporation that you showed. Um, we know, like Rosetta does a really good job trying to identify better binders of substrates, but I think the idea is that maybe it sometimes struggles with making better catalysts. So I was curious if you did any in vitro work with your evolved synthetase, like to understand what is what is the basis of that improved activity? Was it better binding of the substrate, like lower KMs, better catalytic turnover? I was just curious if you know, like why why was that better? A, a better substrate or a better enzyme? Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you very much. So um, the problem uh, that we have, you know, I criticize also that uh, we made orthogonal enzymes uh, more than 20 years and uh, we are not publishing uh, catalytic parameters. We are not publishing CACAT KM, CACAT over KM. And yeah. this is my, would be my great critic to Pete Schultz. He made a great work but actually, but on the other hand, it, it would be unfair to criticize some, some on this because um, what we have, you know, the way how we are testing uh, amine acetylene synthetase is uh, just one radioactivity assay, C14, amine acetylation C14, or pyrophosphate exchange methods, which are developed 1966, published by Kalender and Berg, Paul Berg. And since then, we don't have really <laughs> something which, uh, which could better uh, uh, um, catalytically characterize our amino acid DNA synthesis. There are some assays, some uh, fluorescence assays we tried, but it never worked. So what we are doing, actually, we are just looking in our uh, GFP. And you know, with GFP, you can do everything. And then we have, a, uh, we have a, this fluorescence signal, and this fluorescence signal, signal is good. And so therefore, it would be now great, of course, if we can catalyze, we can make what is activation rate, what is the DNA uh, 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 charging rate, what is the interaction with the allogation factor TU, what about accommodation ribosome and so on. You can invest, I mean, in Germany, there are people who are Max Planck directors who are doing nothing else but the research. And I was expecting some of them will do this research, but actually nobody wants to do this research because, you know, you, you make this research, you make proper param parameterization, and you can publish only low, so called low cited journals. And that's the very unfortunately, uh, the limit is not scientific, but sociological. I think we can do this, but uh, uh, it's a question of resources and it's a question of motivation. But we should do it because without parameterization, we will not make any step forward. Because we have now a really, I mean, your question is, is really great. Because we have something, and, and what I presented to you is, is, is optical signal of GFP. It's not scientific. It's even not, strictly speaking, it's not scientific. But it's real science is provide me some numbers, some numbers of your molecules that are interacting. What I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I found in myself a GFP signal, which has a much higher signal than, than uh, when I transform cell with the Schulz plasma. What is this for scientific argument? I mean, this is the maybe argument for, for yeah, for maybe some, um, uh, uh, some, some uh, light or, or some, 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 some very uh, not, not um, high level science. Yeah. Anyway, so 
Uh, and this you can you can when especially when you talk with the with the with the classical enzymologists, they really criticize us very heavily. Yes. Yeah. We uh, we I we we very much agree with all that as well. Um, we have one question from the audience uh, who asks, "Can you speculate why the C three two one strain failed to produce high translation of the superfolder GFP?" I think this strain is. At least in our experience, this strain is, uh, is is a good when you have, for example, single in-frame stop codon. This strain is not is, is not so bad, and it, this strain is also curiously works also not so bad with aerolysial system. But in our hand, it didn't work well with this um, uh, with this metanocardial focus system. I can speculate. Uh, I think the strain. Although this strain is a little bit cured, it's, it's also a little bit made robust through the through the uh, adaptive laboratory evolution. I think this uh, uh, methodology, which was used by Church and co-workers, also produced most probably lots of uh, uh, off mutations, or maybe made some uh, we call it military in military terms collateral damage. Such such engineering most probably damaged in some way which we maybe don't understand and we can still could not follow uh, genome of the cell and maybe physiology physiology of, of, of the cell so we should certainly find the way also how to although the i mean author claim in this in this paper of, of church they claim that the cells are robust but they are not robust when you compare with bl21 so my working hypothesis would be collateral damage due the during this uh, massive massive engineering in the genome Right, right. 